joining us for this week's a and Thursdays here at BAM PFA. Um, as many of you know, uh, this is a series that's sponsored through the campus's Arts and Design Initiative and supported by our friends here at BAM PFA um, and also tied to an ongoing course this term called Responsible Design from Bits to Buildings. This week, it's very exciting to have Melody Ashar with us, um, who is at the forefront of what is really a new design field of design for space. Uh, she is one of the co-founders of Space Exploration Architecture, or Search Plus, um, and they are a pioneering firm uh, who are thinking about applications of architecture, interaction design, material science, and other fields in the context of space exploration. In the recent years, two proposals um, that came out of Search Plus, the Mars Ice House and the Mars X House have won prestigious awards through NASA-sponsored competitions. Um, and Melody is currently here in the Bay Area more and more as she takes on a new research program um, in partnership with NASA Ames. Melody's background really uh, positions her well to intervene in this new field, which is boundary crossing and which requires a lot of different kinds of design thinking to think through the challenges of exploring and living in space. Uh, she actually is returning here to Berkeley today. She studied rhetoric at Cal as an undergraduate, in addition to studying industrial design at Art Center in Los Angeles. Um, and she has two master's degrees, uh, one in human-computer interaction from Carnegie Mellon, and the second in architecture from Columbia. So I think her thinking um, is bridging domains and asking really interesting questions about how we center the human as we think about life beyond Earth. So on that note, I'll ask you to join me in welcoming Melody for what I'm sure will be a really wonderful talk. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, that makes it very easy just to launch right into the discussion. But yes, I, I am a co-founder of Space Exploration Architecture, which is a small applied research practice and startup that is devoted to designing and conceiving concepts for human space exploration, particularly deep space habitats. Uh, I am also a senior researcher within the Human Systems Integration Division of NASA Ames, where I work on human factors problems relevant to human-machine interaction. So those two worlds, architecture, construction, and human-machine interaction, are what I want to discuss with you today. And really, it's the foundation of the conceptual work that I do and the applied work that I do professionally as well. So human factors in autonomous buildings designed for Earth, the Moon, and Mars. Autonomous construction, there we go. Autonomous construction was really the entry point in Search Plus's work conceiving of autonomously deployed deep space habitats, particularly surface habitats. Uh, we got our start submitting to NASA's 3D printed habitat challenge, which was a centennial challenge with its first phase in 2015. And the the pr basically the solicitation was not only for a concept of operations for the habitat itself, but also for the architectural design of its interior as well as its functioning and space allocation and programmatic requirements as well. So we're at a point, at least in the work that I'm doing, where we're not only conceiving of how we build, but why we're building and what we're building. And autonomy and robotics are absolutely questions relevant to that field, and particularly so for space. Why do we want to look at autonomy, and why are we interested in autonomous construction for space? It's because it's too risky, as it is right now, and this assumption of NASA, excuse me, and a number of other space agencies is that we want to be sure that we have a pressurized environment that can sustain human life prior to any crewed mission arriving at the surface of another planet, be it the moon or Mars. So how do we do that? We do it through robotics, and we do that through autonomy. Here's another example of mini builders. Uh, this is a project done by Peter Novikov, who also collaborated with us on the Mars Ice House concept. This is interesting because it's looking at small swarm robots and how they can work together collaboratively to 3D print a structure. Uh, I'll show you an example for a project that I worked on that 
is, is developing this uh, to, to a different extent. But the overall mission statement, I should say, of Search Plus based exploration architecture is to conceive, investigate, and produce innovative human-centered designs which enable human, building, uh, human beings to not only li live, but thrive in space environments beyond Earth. And what we do as a group of architects, technologists, industrial designers, and human factor specialists is that we assemble and we collaborate with groups of subject matter experts. This started very off as just friends of friends and academics that we knew from, from graduate school. And, and over time, as the caliber of our projects uh, went up and up and up, the caliber of those consultants and those subject matter experts likewise became more high profile. So we work with ISRE subject matter experts, radiation subject matter experts, structural engineers, planetary roboticists, astrophysicists, and we've worked across many NASA centers now, NASA Langley, NASA Marshall, uh, myself at Ames, and Johnson. These are our habitation projects. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the two surface habitats that we submitted to the NASA 3D Printed Habitat Challenge today, but we've, all, we've also done some work in orbital space habitats as well. Just to step back a bit, um, it's a little out there <laughs> to be talking about space architecture as a, as a real, I guess you could say, professional practice. And we're absolutely not at the point where we can say that this is something that, for example, we can we, we practice commercially because we don't. But the conceptions of space architecture and the conceptions of what it means to live in outer space have been with us culturally in popular culture for decades and decades. And I would go so far as to say that it has impacted our ideas of future living architecturally and in terms of engineering in a radical way. Um, and it, it has contributed to our collective ideas of what futurism is, of what it means to think about a future life and think about what it means to live sustainably and to live um, in an ecologically sustainable way. This is Rainer Banham's environmental bum, bu uh, bubble. And what's interesting about it is that you have this conception of an enclosed environment that uh, w with its inhabitants kind of clustered around this technological totem pole. And so he, he discusses this, that, that, that series of instruments on the center as a transportable standard of living package uh, within a mobile habitat that's environmentally friendly, equipped by solar panels for a hippie yet hyper-technological nomad youth. And I wonder to what extent this indicates the way that we are approaching habitat design for our own practice, but also the way that we're approaching terrestrial design, given that we are <laughs> approaching a, an increasingly hyper-technological state of being. And that's not only in terms of the way that we interact with technology uh, on a person-to-person -person basis, but our buildings themselves are becoming more and more intelligent, more and more smart. They're becoming self-regulating, self-maintaining, and the, the intelligence that's imbued within them and the data that we actually have and that we're trying to actually process is enabling us to see buildings in a different way. And it really is technology and not so much as enclosure. This is, uh, on the left you see a drawing that was created for Russian cosmonauts explaining their environmental life control and support, environmental life control and life support, uh, environmental control and life support system, uh, which is sustaining human life in outer space. This is short, uh, the acronym, Aerospace Loves Acronyms, is ECLIS. What ECLIS does is it regulates temperature, waste management, water management, um, and a whole bunch of other telemetry items. And on the right, you have anatomy of a dwelling showing a huge network of cables and tubes accumulating in what Rainer Benham again has discussed as a Baroque ensemble of domestic gadgets between the sky with a TV antenna and the earth. So, and, and I, I wanna read for a second what Rainer Benham has wrote about this in particular. He says, when your house contains such a complex of piping, flutes, ducts, wires, lights, inlets, outlets, ovens, sinks, refuse disposers, hi-fi reverberators, antenna, etc. When it contains so many services that the hardware could stand up by itself without any assistance from the house, why have a house to hold it up? In space, it's very clear. You're designing for a, 
for an inhospitable environment and the safety of the humans and the astronauts is absolutely paramount. Um, and risk mitigation for human health and human safety is number one when it comes to aerospace design and when it comes to thinking about how we can design sustainably in outer space. This is what ECLIS looks like aboard the International Space, space Station. It's highly technical software. It tends to be organized into functional groups and functional palettes. And the thing that we need to remember about this hardware is that unlike the way that we conceive of mechanical and electrical systems here on Earth being like literally within a closet and out of sight, is that these guys don't have anybody else to repair and maintain this hardware that is literally keeping them alive. It is a part of their everyday life. It is a part of their routine scheduling. They work with it and they have to be sure that it's functioning so that, you know, so that they can live aboard the, the space station. So as a project example, United Technology Aerospace Systems, uh, that's UTAS, approached us with one of these pallets they're, basically, it's a fancy word for, for a module containing all of this hardware for air revitalization and these types of things. Um, and they asked us, you know, how can we integrate this within a, a future idea as part of the Next Step program for a habitat that astronauts could actually interact with and then repair and maintain them as need be? And so these are some of the ideas that we came up with. Um, for how these pallets could be organized within an inflatable habitat. These were concepts that we shared and that were shared subsequently with a bunch of habitat uh, providers and primes, which I'll show you on another slide. But one of the first things that, that the engineers at UTAS asked us was, well, why can't it just be a flat door? I mean, and why do we need to make a mock-up of this? It's just a locker, it's just a door. And we created a full-scale mock-up of the palette that we designed in addition to the handle, in addition to the way that the screen interface sort of like fits into the overall hardware. And they were absolutely amazed. They were like, oh my god, we had no idea it's that big. And I'm like, really? Really? <laughs> so it just goes to show you uh, the power of design and the significance of design. Uh, design advocacy in these other domains, which I think you guys as students should absolutely be thinking forward to. Um, and we introduced a whole bunch of other features into the palette as well. So uh, the concept was that this as a, as a hardware device would be implemented as a universal systems palette for ECLIS, environmental life control, uh, environmental life support, to other habitat providers such as Orville, ATK, Bigelow, et cetera. What's interesting about this from my perspective uh, is that we're not only looking at how this hardware integrates from a vehicle level, like the super high level, the actual ship, and if we're going to be speaking metaphorically to architecture in terms of the structure or the building, but it also trickles the implications of the design trickle down to the sensor actuator level or the human interface level. How are these people actually working with this hardware? How are they working with the encasement of that hardware? What does that mean in terms of what that interaction is and what that experience is? And how is it going to impact design, bottom line? Uh, let's say, I mean, in any project, you have a design freeze, at which point you need to be able to say and anticipate these are the problems that might arise. These are the things that we need to consider prior to them being manufactured and then shipped and then launched. Um, it's the same in aerospace, right? So we're looking at designing at multiple scales, multiple experiences, and the integration of these different elements at both the human level as well as the level of the systems integration is absolutely important here. So I'll come back again to this idea of Rainer Benham sitting around the technological totem inside of this environmental bubble. Um, what does it mean to have a transportable standard of living package? What exactly is that? What is he getting across? What is the relationship of ourselves with technology within this enclosure? And I can't help but remember that, you know, the, the manner and the aesthetics and the stylistic sort of touch that is given to the technology that we have here, the screens, the interfaces, etc., is all too familiar to me in terms of the way that cockpit design and interface design happens in NASA as well. So on the left, we have the cockpit design for the lunar module. And it, it sort of beckons the question to me for systems that need to be functioning completely autonomously, 
Even building systems, you don't want to think twice about whether your ventilation is working or not. You want them just to, to happen uh, in an automated way. For systems that need to be functioning in a rel relatively automated manner, what does it mean to actually interact with these systems once we get to that higher level um, of experience? So for example, in a space habitat. And also, if we really are just designing for our interactions with technology, what does that mean? What does that mean from an interaction standpoint? Are we optimizing that interaction with technology? Are we facilitating that? It's just something that I, that I like to think about. But essentially, what, it, what Rainer Banham and the UTAS project signified to me is that we're designing for what is essentially a hyperphysical system, where the people are interacting with these systems as inputs, and we have outputs which respond environmentally, which respond to the structure. And there are implications for this, particularly if we're talking about an ecologically closed loop sustainable system, uh, such, as we, such as we hope our, our buildings one day will be. Um, and, and there's an interesting relationship in my mind between what we can design to be ecologically sustainable and what is a closed loop system, what is bioregenerative, and what is a technological feedback system. There's a, there's a parallel there in my mind in the way that we can experience both along similar lines, but I don't think that's really been explored yet in building construction or in architecture today. Uh, Cedric Price came up with this idea of the first intelligent building, and it's interesting to me that it has everything to do with self-assembly and construction, just as an example. Let's bring it back to construction and building again. Um, in, po in, in popular science, the first CNC at MIT uh, was described, and this was in 1955, as a power tool that's designed to run itself. I mean, we have CNCs in power shops today where they're, f they're a far, far cry away from running themselves, but why the interest in autonomy? Why the interest in having these tools basically reaching a degree of independence that is beyond us? And uh, to bring it back to, again to construction automation and robotics, we're interested in self-replication, we're interested in self-assembly, we're interested in these ideas, particularly as designers, but w what is the context in which this technology is actually emerging? Um, what can we learn from the manufacturing context and what exactly are we gaining terrestrially uh, when we look at construction automatic and, uh, automation and robotics in, uh, in this way? So, okay, the research context in which my group has been doing the work that we've been doing for the Centennial Challenges competition and afterwards has always been inside of some kind of clean lab, uh, particularly in the work that I'll show you. We were at the Autodesk Build Space for the submissions of the competition. And the eventual application for this 3D printing prototyping work that we've been doing is anticipated to happen for the Moon and Mars. Um, but personally, I'm interested in how we can introduce an immediate application for Earth terrestrially in order to introduce dual use value, meaning value in the near term here for Earth and long term value for space, and look at the social impact of the technologies that we're actually creating when it comes to autonomous construction, and uh, hopefully we'll learn something about that al along the way. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the 3D printed habitat work that Search Plus has done. Uh, we got our start in 2015, submitting to the phase one centennial challenge for a 3D printed habitat on Mars. We won that challenge, and then more recently, this past year, we won first place again for the phase three challenge for, uh, the same, frankly, the same competition, which was reinstated by NASA for other reasons that I'll, I'll get into. Um, and we won first place again. So we've basically won both, which is all of NASA's design solicitations for Mars habitats. Uh, 3D printing a habitat. Let's go to the basics. So at a fun, sorry, at a fundamental level, the most critical concept for 3D printing a habitat um, is in situ resource utilization. Th what this means is that you want to be using the local and indigenous sources material resources of the habit, uh, excuse me, of the planetary surface rather than bringing and launching everything from Earth. Why do we want to do that? It's because it's prohibitively expensive right now using our current rocket chemical propulsion technology to ship a pre-integrated habitat. It's just too much mass, it's too heavy. So we want to take advantage 
of the local and indigenous materials resources in order to come up with a building construction material and come up with the, and, and basically leverage all of that for, for infrastructure. The next thing that's going to happen is you're going to have some kind of landing mechanism that's going to autonomously deploy and all of your subsystems for 3D printing, for water mining, for power, energy, et cetera, are going to deploy from this lander. The next thing that's going to happen is you're going to prospect the area, be it the moon or Mars, uh, for the appropriate materials and an appropriate site for the construction of your habitat. Next, you're going to have some robotic deployment or possibly a fleet of robots. This is an example presented by Off World, which is a, com uh, which is a company in Pasadena. And it's going to collect your materials and prepare the site for construction and 3D printing. In this case, they're using regolith. And then finally, you're going to have uh, some robotic fleet or a number of robotic elements or possibly a gantry system that will be 3D printing the habitat itself. This is an example from ESA and Foster and Partners on the right and on the left is Baruch Koshevny's um, and Contour Crafting when, when he was working on a, moon pro a lunar proposal. And all of this is going to be happening telerobotically, again, because it's too risky right now to be sending a crewed mission to Mars without a uh, pressurized environment for them to take refuge in. At the time, we were only were, we were only considering Mars because that was the <laughs> program emphasis way back in 2015. That has since shifted to the moon. But frankly, all of the work is the same. Anyway, Mars Ice House was the first prize in NASA's Phase One 3D Printed Habitat Challenge. Uh, for Mars Ice House, we introduced a concept for a water. Uh, Habitat created out of water ice that would water ice that would be enclosed within an ETFE pressurized membrane. Why did we choose water as a building construction material? The first reason is that it's a source of life. Any long term or long duration mission to another planet is going to require a sustainable resource for water, both for the crew but also for the production of methane fuel, um, which will be used in return missions back to Earth. Uh, the most critical reason is that water is a superior radiation shield to regolith. Regolith is Mars soil. And this, we felt, was the critical component that enabled us to win because we, were, we decided that shielding against radiation would be the, func would be the most significant uh, element at hand in designing habitats. And um, human health was something that we needed to prioritize above all else. Water is, of course, indigenous to Mars, so this supports the ISRU, in situ resource utilization argument. And finally, water provides uh, water ice as a construction material would provide natural light, translucency for habitat uh, for humans and plants to actually thrive. Uh, we were trying to achieve as great, uh, as much as similarity in how we would be living terrestrially here on Earth as we would on Mars. Um, Again, there's, it's not for nothing that Mars is known as our sister planet. So making sure that that transition is as seamless as possible was something that we hope to achieve with the translucency argument. So we have plenty of evidence that subsurface ice has been identified even a few centimeters below the regolith uh, surface. And instead of going underground or introducing a subterranean habitat, which tends to be uh, the typical typology when it comes to surface habitats that intend to shield and protect the crew against radiation, um, and what we're talking about by radiation is solar galactic uh, events, solar particle events, as well as cosmic radiation. Uh, we decided that going underground after traveling six to eight months to arrive to the surface of a new planet would not be acceptable. And if we were going to excavate and then put people underground within a pressurized environment, we didn't really understand the point of that. And we wanted to celebrate the technology of 3D printing. It was also a requirement of the competition that we would be using 3D printing. So. Unless we were to be using a lava tube, for example, and there are plenty of examples of viable lava tube proposals for space architecture, uh, we didn't see much benefit in going underground and proposing a 3D printed habitat. So instead, we proposed a clear pressurized membrane on the outside, as well as a pre 3D printed ice shell on the inside. And the membrane is, specific, is particularly important because ice would sublimate on the surface of Mars if it was not enclosed, if it was not pressurized. Uh, again, water is superior at shielding against radiation over Mars regolith as well as aluminum, and this was a clear 
winner in our mind in terms of what we would be proposing and why. As you can see here, we have a vertically oriented lander that is surrounded by two ice shells. We introduced two ice shells for the sake of redundancy of the habitat. Should there be some kind of micrometeorite uh, impact from, from above, you at least have you at least are ensuring redundancy so that the crew is still protected. There we go. We also introduced a hydroponic greenhouse that would be cascading from the vertical lander. And at the top level, a wardroom and galley where the astronauts could theoretically look outside to the Martian landscape. For the pressurized membrane, we, we proposed a clear ETFE membrane with Dyneema reinforcement. Dyneema is essentially ultra-high ultra molecular weight polyethylene. Uh, here's a view of the exterior of the ice house. And in terms of the robotics that we were proposing, this is still speculative. We didn't do any, we didn't do much work or development in this area at all. But we proposed one laser center, regolith centering robot that would be fully outside and exterior to the habitat itself to pretend, uh, prevent contamination. Uh, and one fully interior ice printing robot, uh, which, is, which we called the IBO. So here's the Wasibo. Again, this is a fully exterior robot that would be preparing the foundation for the habitat prior to the pressurized membrane being inflated. And here's the IBO. We also introduced silica fibers uh, to augment the mechanical strength of the, uh, the tensile strength of the ice shell as well as aerogel for thermal insulation. We conceived of a concept whereby we could 3D print on the inside of the ice shell but creating consecutive rings for the IBO to scale and then ascend on. Uh, we didn't get to do much more work on this after that, but we won first place, so I mean, it's not a huge deal. In collaboration with McGill University, we, um, we did a couple of small scale prototypes in ice. This is using a methyl ether binder, but to date I have not seen much work. Oh, there we go. I have not seen much work that is developing 3D ice printing without the use of such a binder that would need to be dissolved, but we did do some preliminary kind of like desktop experiments with a really, really, really cold ambient environment just to see whether we could actually get some like developing mounds of ice uh, through a super chilled water stream. This brings us to Mars Ice Home. After the phase one centennial challenge, we, uh, <laughs> the, NASA did not want to move forward with our concept because they felt it was too innovative, too disruptive, and it did not align with the research which was being developed internally at Swamp Works at NASA Kennedy to develop polymer-based regolith habitats. So what happened? They basically said, hey, good job, we'll give you some money, but we're going to reinstate the competition from scratch, and we're going to prohibit anybody from using water as a material. That's what happened. Um, so phase two, uh, water was was eliminated from the rules and you were like deducted points if there was water in your material mix for 3D printing. And then phase three, they realized that because there was no water, nobody could be implementing cementitious or slurry based materials and it was basically impossible to build at scale. So phase three, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, was, was the next iteration of the habitat, of, of the challenge. Uh, but we were very lucky because a Principal investigator at NASA Langley reached out to us and said, hey, I think your concept is really fantastic despite what the competition has, has sort of said about your ice habitat. Why not collaborate and come up with not a 3D printed ice house concept, but one that is filled and then frozen. So with NASA Langley, we collaborated on this concept and we spent a great deal of time coming up with what the material system and the bladder and restraint system for this filled and frozen ice habitat would be. We introduced a clear and adaptable workspace that could be used for any number of things over the course of a mission. And uh, here's a view of the outside. We did a, several rounds of explorations of what the cellular geometry of this inflated and frozen ice habitat would be, which was really exciting for us from an architectural perspective. We still needed to be thinking about how the inflatable would actually deploy within a mission scenario, but also we needed to be thinking about how much water we would be filling and freezing and what the surface area to volume ratio of each one of these ice cells is. And, uh, Finally, whether we can actually achieve the translucency that we need. 
We introduced CO, uh, carbon dioxide insulation pockets to ensure that there wouldn't be abrasion between the cells. Uh, we had never really seen examples of uh, cells that would be frozen like this and then maintained structurally. Igloos are one such example, but they're not really contained within a within a within a kind of pressurized bubble, for lack of a description. Uh, here's a view of the ice home interior. And this is some of the functional prototyping that we were very lucky to be able to do. This work was done at Lamont, Univers uh, Lamont Laboratory, which is affiliated with Columbia University. This was a very preliminary experiment to fill and freeze ice within a Tedlar bag, which is, but also within a vacuum. Why did we want to do this? We wanted to determine whether we could actually achieve the translucency that we want by making sure that the ice grain was of a sufficient size. So larger ice grain means that you have more translucency in the ice. And uh, also larger ice grain is just better mechanically when you're talking about a ice shell. And we also were able to do some work with Langley and their materials science group there, filling and freezing uh, water within Tedlar bags. Ice expands when it freezes, so how much you're filling and what kind of bag or plastic or whatever inflatable that you're using all has implications for the integrity of the structure itself. Um, so there were like labels on some of these bags, the fittings were all different, and that experiment was enough for us to be accepted to the MISI program, which is the Materials and Space Science Experiment. So we have sam material samples that are aboard the ISS space station right now that are undergoing radiation testing, long-term radiation testing. Uh, the ice home concept spun off into the NASA Big Ideas Challenge, for which myself and my colleague Christina Chardula were organizers and judges. And essentially, what we were doing in this in this habitat challenge that we put together with, with Kevin Kempton and others at NASA Langley was we proposed a university challenge that would leverage the in situ resource utilization resources of the ice home in order for the students to conceive of a Mars greenhouse concept. Um, so this is showing how the energy, CO2, water, et cetera, the uh, infrastructure that's already in place that would be used for the deployment of ice home could actually translate for the deployment of a sustainable food resource for an eventual Mars crew. And that brings us to Mars X House, which is the most recent winner of the phase three 3D printed habitat challenge. What we did in this submission is that instead of working with water ice, we basically said, okay, we get it. We know you want us to work with regolith. And that's what we did. Uh, we proposed a regolith and high, uh, high density polyethylene habitat proposal and it won first place, which is great. The design drivers for this submission as well as all of our others are, are very similar. Um, we are intending to merge and to integrate environmental drivers that are specific to Mars with constructability and mission drivers that are specific to a future Mars mission, as well as human factors elements, which I think are specific and, and uh, particularly suited to architectural design. So things like light and views, functional organization, safety and redundancy, as well as egress. Here's a view of X House from the exterior. The structural concept of the habitat, and frankly of any surface habitat, is that you, in, in an environment such as Mars where the atmosphere is extremely thin, you're going to be containing a great deal of pressure on the inside if you want to ensure that you, you are, that the astronauts can live with uh, Earth environmental pressure on the inside. So the forces are all coming out, blowing out from the inside, essentially. What you have is, an, is a structure, a pressure vessel, that would be best suited towards an inflatable. What we decided to do uh, is to introduce this hyperboloid concept, which essentially introduces an inward-facing arc that would be rotated uh, in order to contain the pressure, almost like in the same way that a dam would hold back um, water, and that was our that was our formal approach to the pressurization problem. In terms of materiality, like I said, we, were, we introduced a regolith concrete as well as a high density polyethylene inner layer. Why did we want to use both? Regolith would really be to ensure the uh, structural and dur structural durability of the habitat itself to shield against impacts from the outside 
high density polyethylene we chose for two reasons. A, it's extremely good at protecting against radiation. It can be produced in situ, which is fantastic. And also, it, um, Mars regolith is known to contain toxic perchlorates that are hazardous to hum human health, and we did not want to risk having those come into contact with the astronauts without some kind of procedure or filtering. Uh, so high density polyethylene was the only material, and it also has the highest technology readiness level of all the materials that are being proposed for habitats right now. So that was the interior material that we decided to use. We introduced three functionally separate service areas and zones, uh, two for laboratories as well as one for living areas, and we introduced three equalist volumes that would be servicing each one of these zones separately. And then finally, we introduced uh, an egress tunnel, which is something that none of the other teams had done. Uh, you know, I mean, you think about terrestrial buildings, like two-hour fire stairs, is absolutely something that you need to be thinking about, but not something that we've been thinking about in terms of Mars. And then we did the path of travel calculations to ensure that it actually works, and it did. Here's a, oh, sorry. Here's a, I hope, there we go. Here's an explanation of the three service zones that we introduced, one for the living areas and two for the laboratory zone, uh, areas. If you have like a lethal pathogen that comes in from the outside from the Mars regolith, you need to ensure that the areas of the habitat can be cellularized so that that pathogen or whatever it is doesn't spread to other areas of your habitat. This is why we have these three cellularized areas that are being se serviced separately uh, with separate ventilation, et cetera. Here's a view of excess from the outside. Now I'm gonna walk you through some of the program spaces. At the bottom floor, we have two laboratories. One is intended for engineering repair and maintenance. Basically, it would contain 3D printers that are desktop scale that the astronauts could be using for their everyday repairs on the inside of the habitat. Um, and then the other would be specifically for biological and life sciences, uh, and particularly so to be, and particularly we were anticipating that the astronauts and the crew would be working with uh, geological samples taken from the outside to in, basically search for life uh, across the Martian landscape. And so uh, we, we introduced a material sample pass through where the astronauts could basically take those samples and then pass them through safely into the laboratory. And uh, we also introduced a rover port as well as suit ports that are fully exterior to the habitat. We also introduced some redundant suit ports on the inside as well, but we felt that uh, redundancy in that area is extremely important, particularly when it comes to EVAs, extravehicular activity. Here's a view of the laboratory interiors. Uh, we did some work looking at what the experimental modules would be for those laboratories and how they would need to be launched and shipped and brought <laughs> to the habitat. On the second level, we have our hygiene and mechanical systems. We introduced a pre-integrated mechanical core that I'll show you in just a second on this level of the habitat. Third level are the bedrooms and the greenhouse. So here's a view of the exterior of the bedrooms. And then right above that are the other two crew quarters. So we have four, this is all of these habitat designs. Uh, the program brief that NASA puts out is for a crew of four, and uh, they would be living over the course of one Earth year on the surface of the planet. And then finally, on the, on the last level, we've introduced a wardroom and operations area. This is a communal zone for the astronauts where they could be prepping food, they could eat together, and it's just a general relaxation area. So there's a range between functional work areas, private areas, and then communal areas. We leveraged the infrastructure of what is known as the Autonomous Surface Site Establishment, which is a concept that was put together at NASA Langley, whereby we can have an ISRU concept of operations for power, water, and landing sites, basically. And we said, because we had already worked with Langley and, and some of the people who had put this concept together before, we said we're going to leverage the infrastructure here in order to come up with the system that we need to design our habitat. Oh, there we go, <laughs> sorry. Here's the view of the exterior of the habitat itself. Part of the autonomous surface site establishment uh, included a concept for the Hercules single stage reusable vehicle 
this was significant to us because we needed to size all of our robotic and habitat elements within the payload bay of this particular vehicle. So that's what we did. Everything that we designed basically, and, and we came up with the volumetric calculations for this as well, um, fits inside of the Hercules single stage payload bay. Here was our concept for the 3D printer that we actually proposed. Um, it's a six axis robotic arm on, on top of a, essentially what's a rover base. Here's a view of that again, and we introduced two of them, again for redundancy, so that if one were to malfunction, the other could still continue and finish up printing and constructing the habitat. Um, high density polyethylene uh, could, be re could be manufactured locally on Mars um, by scrubbing the atmosphere for CO2 and creating methane, and then that could eventually form ethylene and eventually polyethylene. And uh, there's also a theory that recyclables on your way, uh, on the transit trip to Mars that would be used for packaging food and things that are basically expendable could be ground up, recycled, and reused into form polymers, such as polyethylene. This is our concept for the deployable mechanical core. Basically, your ECLIS volumes, hygiene modules, uh, all fit inside of this nice tin can, aluminum can, and it would deploy upwards and also ensure that you have a, a kind of support structure for the uh, printing of horizontal floor plates, which to date nobody has really done or conceived of. This is a simulation of the construction sequence of the habitat. So you have the deployment of the mechanical core, um, and then the polyethylene is printed first. There's a robotic process that we introduced for the emplacement of the windows, and that has a lot to do with some of the work that I'm doing now with the emplacement of other elements into 3D printed structures, which I'm not going to talk about. And then um, the regolith shell is printed next, followed by the egress tunnel. So all of this was done in Navis Works. Um, a big focus of the habitat uh, of the habitat challenge itself is to integrate workflows between architects, engineers, and construction technology partners, um, particularly as it relates to BIM. And this is an area of much development that I think that anybody can really contribute to if you have even a tertiary knowledge of these areas. Uh, we did some structural analysis on two load cases for the habitat. One was pressurization, and the other was this water bladder that we introduced at the very top of the habitat, again for radiation shielding, but also to introduce a sustainable water resource. We introduced uh, continuous reinforcement from the very, very top to the very, very bottom of the habitat. And this is going to go into the material system. So you can see here that we have polyethylene on the far, far inside, regolith on the far, far outside, as well as the continuous basalt fiber reinforcement that is sandwiched between. And this is going to show the sequence in which the habitat is printed. So we have the foundation first, polyethylene next, the window assembly. And uh, we introduced a foam layer for thermal insulation as well as expansion and contraction. And it ends with the regolith concrete. We did a bit on the simulating the trajectory speed of printing and anticipating the volume that we would need to actually 3D print at the habitat. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that. This was the slicer software that we used to determine how long it would actually take to to print the habitat itself. And uh, this is a model of X House, which is going to be exhibited at the London Design Museum in the middle of next month. I don't know if any of you are planning on being on London in the area, but they're doing a big Mars exhibition. Um, and I should also mention, if you haven't been to San Francisco MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, to see their far out exhibition, um, Mars Ice, a model of Mars Ice House is also being exhibited there. So um, following some of this work, we did some initial construction prototyping work, 3D printing and concrete, and we were able, I mean, as, as a result of a residency program that I was awarded with Autodesk Build Space, which is in the upper right, um, which is a facility in Boston that is geared towards uh, industrial manufacturing and prototyping, and uh, they accept residencies and they have an incubation program. Uh, we submitted two construction levels, one and two of the 3D printed challenge and also won those. Construction level 
two, which is what you see here, basically required contestants to 3D print a basin, such as you see, and to fill it up with water to determine whether or not you can actually achieve a watertight structure through 3D printing alone. The idea being that a watertight structure could anticipate whether you could create and uh, manufacture an airtight structure that would be required for, the, for a pressurized environment in an other world scenario. Uh, the other thing that, I, that is specific about this in, in particular is that they also asked us to, oops, sorry, they also asked us to robotically in place, as it's called, two um, pipe interfaces, a small pipe that you see up in the left and then a large pipe that you see at the bottom right. I don't know why that's not playing, sorry. So what would happen is at a particular point within the 3D printing process, there was a digital signal that was sent from the printer to an ABB robotic arm and it would lift and lower and squish down the pipe into the mortar material. Really imprecise, but frankly, nobody has a better way of doing it right now. So this is an area of research that I'm working on right now. And yeah, it was extremely tense at the moment because like we don't have ways to mitigate against things going wrong here. Home is uh, a new project that is being initiated that has been awarded by NASA to two universities, UC Davis and Purdue, and that is being led by former astronaut Steve Robinson. Um, the concept for home is to develop a self-maintained, self-regulating, resilient, smart deep space habitat that could be functioning and, and operational both within a crewed configuration as well as an uncrewed configuration. So this is where my interest and where my research is really headed towards at the moment, is how we can introduce autonomy within the systems so that they can anticipate anomalies, anticipate problems before they happen, but also address the human aspect so that when you do have a crewed configuration, that you're actually addressing the needs of the astronauts um, and the interactions that the astronauts would be having with the technology there. Uh, this is some machine vision stuff I'm going to skip over. <laughs> and then uh, to conclude, we really try and align the work that we're doing with space exploration architecture with the UN Sustainable Development Goals so that we can introduce near-term value in the technology and the research that we're proposing for Earth with long-term value for space. And there is synergy here. There is alignment here. Um, the space sector has long been the source and the inspiration for technological advancement, and design for space brings out the best in design for Earth. Uh, so things like 3D printing, zero-net energy, high-performance buildings, smart homes, uh, has a direct impact on future living. It has a direct impact on the technology that we introduce terrestrially for our future sustainable buildings, architecture, cities, etc. So this is something that we really celebrate and that we really that we really advocate for. Uh, three takeaways. So we're looking now at building and construction methods that are regionally specific so that we can do 3D printing in developing areas, anticipating applications for Moon and Mars. We look at sustainable material innovation that enhances performance, particularly so as it relates to 3D printing and how we can introduce reinforcement and reinforcement methods that will support 3D printing both terrestrially and in space. And then finally, we, we are looking at automation that is cost and time efficient and that reduces risk. And uh, that is what will bring the most value to robotics here on Earth in the near term and eventually for deployment and uh, implementation on the Moon and Mars. And that's all I have for you. Hi. Um, so incredible, incredible talk. I think your work is amazing. Uh, but I think my biggest question is, with all of these incredible projects that you've worked on, and um, uh, specifically Search Plus, and these groups that you formed, uh, where did you start? How did you even begin to oh, get to where you are? Um, I'm glad you asked that. Personally, I think, you know, you obviously started as a kid, and you've grown up, and now you're doing these amazing things. How did you have an interest in space? Did you have an interest in design? What's what's your story? 
That's great. I'm glad you asked that. Well, I, I, it, it's always strange talking to a new crowd because I don't know anything about who you guys are. But okay, how many of you are students? Raise your hand. How many of you are design students? How many of you are in some kind of engineering or technical discipline? Oh, awesome. Okay, that's like pretty even. It's like design and technical engineering. Uh, who did I miss? If you didn't raise your hand, raise your hand. <laughs> Somebody call out what you're studying or what you're looking at. Awesome. Somebody else. Amazing. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I started as an undergrad here at Cal in rhetoric. Nothing to do with any of this, okay? Um, what I knew though is that I knew that I wanted to be working in technology and the way that people handle or deal with technology. When, when I graduated, this is a true story, I was so deeply envious of anybody who was working on computers to make anything, literally anything, that it was what inspired me to go back to school for industrial design. I was so, so deeply envious of people who were working with software, thinking about software and what that could create and what the potential of that was, that it, it was just very clear to me that I had, <laughs> I had devoted four years of my life into exploring something completely theoretical, but that was instrumental in situating the work that I'm doing now within a conceptual framework that I think is extremely unique. Um, so I'll say that. From industrial design, I went to graduate school in architecture. From graduate school in architecture, I went to graduate school in human-computer interaction, and I'm hoping that's the end of it academically for me. Um, but I've, I've also taught undergrads in architecture and in industrial design, and what I'm most surprised by is how insular that education becomes. And I think it's the same for engineering too, because now I mostly work with engineers. Nobody's going out and having conversations with people in other disciplines and other departments, because and I understand, like as a student, you don't really have an incentive to, you know, you're kind of just trying to get it done with. Um, but I would really encourage that. I would really encourage people in architecture to go speak with people in civil engineering or people who are in computer science to go speak with people who are looking at building automation. Um, I think that those relationships now, for me, today, are the most valuable and the most lucrative for the way that I think and the way that I work. I hope that answers your question. I thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on sort of the trajectory of the space in industry in general um, in terms of like the emergence of more private companies uh, pioneering space innovation and working with NASA or other government funded agencies. Um, I wanted to know if you had any sort of experience or thoughts with that and how the two can work together or if they should, um, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I was telling Robert earlier, I, I now, I've been at NASA as a contractor for six months now, and I've already encountered the bureaucratic sort of glacial pace at which work and technology sort of happens. And frankly, the friends that I have who are graduating from PhD programs now are not looking to have a 10-year career so at somewhere like NASA, which, um, well, at least Ames is very research-based, but if you're talking about Johnson, which is all about astronautics, or if you're talking about Marshall, which is all about rockets, and if you're talking about Kennedy, which is all about launch, by all means, go do that work, be on the ground there, and NASA will always have clients and customers who are coming for that work. But if you're a researcher like me, <laughs> you might encounter some issues in terms of the pace of the work as well as the... Uh, funding and monetization of the work that you might want to do, or at least that's what I've encountered. So I think commercial partnerships with NASA and frankly other international government agencies is absolutely the way of the future. Um, it's what search has been approached with and uh, yeah, that's what I would say.
The second one, when for our estimate, we came up with an estimate for just the regolith shell, and this is only based off of the speed of printing for the technology that we were prototyping with on a, at Build Space in Boston. So we didn't do any kind of simulation for like Mars environmental conditions or anything like that. I could go back to the slide. I don't even remember what it is off the top of my head. A number of hours, I think, is what we came up with. Yep, six hours for the foundation, 170 hours for the tower, six hours for the roof. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for your talk right here. Um, I In this class so far, we've been thinking a lot recently about exhibitions and curating collections. And so when you mentioned the exhibition in London and also how uh, they've presented your work on the ice, um, Mars Ice House in MoMA, I'm really curious about what are some of your considerations and concerns and thoughts when people choose to include your work um, in a collection of art or work? Oh, that's a, that's a nice question. Um, well, A, it's super flattering, but I mean, t to be honest, when Mars Ice House first won, it went on a kind of world tour. And it was, it was like, as soon as it was out of our hands, we didn't even know where it was going. So it was, it was exhibited at the Mac Center. It was exhibited at the Vitra Museum. It was exhibited at the Mori Art Museum, which was the most fantastic trip I ever took. Um, it was all over. It went to Telefonica in Madrid, and somehow it ended up here uh, in San Francisco. But I think that it, it's been interesting sort of observing the curation process and observing what these different shows and exhibitions see within the project that they leverage for their own purposes and for the narrative of the broader show. So for Vitra, it was a sh it was an exhibition called Hello Robot. For the Mori Art Museum, it was the universe in art, like so broad, so generic. Like the, the range of works there was just, it was unbelievable. Um, so yeah, and then of course there's a small interest in aerospace, like air and space museums, and they're like, hey, can we show this on Kids Day? And we're like, no. So, but it, it, it's interesting that these projects are really situated within an art and architecture and design program when it comes to exhibition. Um. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I want to ask that since your work inherently focuses on looking at the future and how like designs that haven't been established yet or made yet, where do you get your inspiration from? Where would you say you draw on to kind of make these designs to make all these new structures and all this new technology? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that there's a, a common conception that designers like artists are sort of filled with an air of inspiration and motivated to create spontaneously, that's absolutely not what I do. Absolutely not. All of the ideas, all of the work, and all of the decisions that we make from a design perspective are generated and synthesized research findings that we either learn from in subject matter expert research or that we read and that we find in technical white papers. There is nothing that is not a mediated approach trade or kind of uh, discussion or I guess you could say, I don't know. There's, there's nothing that we don't argue against when it comes to the design decisions that we make and everything is really factored into that, into that decision. So I would prefer to think of it as a kind of synthesis and generation of ideas based off of research inputs, right? So it's really, it, it, it's rooted in the research and the best thing that we can do and the thing that we really celebrate in our relationships with the NASA partners that we have is that we bring their work to the forefront. So someone like Bob Moses at NASA Langley, we celebrate this work as an application of his research, for example. 
I'm really curious about the work you did with Autodesk. I also did a fellowship with them about two years ago on human creativity, and I'm curious how your work and your research challenged your tools or production tools, maybe some lessons that Autodesk had from the work that you did with them. So Autodesk basically gave us space to work at uh, their facility. They, and, and they have a whole range of ABB robots and technology, uh, manufacturing and fabrication tools that were at our disposal. They didn't necessarily contribute to the actual work of the project, but they did facilitate us being there and were extremely supportive of the project overall, as well as other teams who were in the competition. Yeah. Oh, over here. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, so my question is to do more with the design process. Um, how do you account for the various redundancies and the unpredictability of a relative foreign environment in the design process, considering that there are certain constraints on effective testing of the design? Hmm. Um, from a structural perspective, it's really just about doing the analysis, like finite element analysis, and then coming up with our findings based off of that. But from a human perspective, really it's just projecting ourselves and projecting an experience of crew schedule, astronaut, uh, basically work and, and life and experience into the habitat to determine what we might have forgotten, what we didn't really consider, and what could be looked at a little bit more closely. By no means do I think that either of the proposals that we have here are like complete and robust you know, solutions to a problem. It's not, it just represents a particular synthesis of research at a particular time, and this might change in 10 years. Hello, um, okay, so thank you for your fascinating presentation. I'm actually a humanities major, and I think I'm now more interested into engineering. And so I was really wondering about like the applications for your projects, so like the current social impact applications on Earth, and I was also wondering, like, when do you potentially see this project actually being, like, deployed into space or, like, actually, like, being implemented on Mars and the Moon? Yeah, I'm going to answer the second part first, okay? Um, before we have habitats, there's going to be really unsexy infrastructure on the Moon and Mars. We're talking about roads, berms, shelters, hangars for equipment because the dust and the regolith kind of, the, the regolith dust is something that's in, they're anticipating is going to be an issue for advanced and very expensive hardware. Um, so it's that habitats and, and ensuring that people can live sustainably within a pressurized environment that is exclusively 3D printed is a very far, far way away. Um, there are other technologies like inflatables and um, I mean, inflatables are even some kind of pre-integrated, like, tin can, aluminum can, that could reasonably get us there faster, and they will. This just represents a particular idea for ISRU additive manufacturing and how that can be applied to inspire and sort of encourage ideas of how, how we're going to be living um, long-term in space. For And then remind me of your first question. Uh, the current applications for... Um like social impact currently in the world? Right, so there's a lot of rhetoric right now surrounding 3D printing and additive manufacturing and how it can be applied for low-income housing, homeless housing, uh, homeless shelters, and uh, basically disaster relief and also creating uh, on-demand structures uh, in areas where there have been some kind of natural disaster, for example. Uh, I haven't seen examples of that deployed just yet, but we're in talks right now with NASA Marshall as well as the Department of Defense to be looking at how we can introduce 3D printing for the Sioux tribes in South Dakota. And we're also working with Icon 3D on a very, very early project to look at how we can deploy this elsewhere. Um, what we bring to that discussion is an understanding that we need to be using the local materials and the local resources of those communities and leveraging the uh, leveraging those communities to become involved in the project as much as we can and then also architectural design. So uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>